Brian Burke joining us in studio. Uh, earlier in the show, I pitched naming the segment uh, Brian's Block, Life of Brian. Uh, any other ideas? No, you're staring at me through the, uh, like, right through my head right now, and you don't like either of those? No. No? <laughs> Do you have an idea for the, no? No. You don't want to name the segment. How about Brian Burke comes on to talk <laughs> hockey? Hockey Talk brought to you by Boston Pizza. Join us every Saturday for Hockey Night in Canada at Boston Pizza. First question is the one that you didn't get to answer last week. What's that? I asked you if Turtles was indeed the greatest one-bite chocolate in the world, and you said you'd have to think about it. Yeah, I'd have to think about it. I, I still think Rolos are right up there. Oh, Rolos is a good whoa, call. Whoa, whoa. What about Reese's? No, How about I, peanut butter cups? I hate peanut butter. I like it on sandwiches, but not in candy or cooking or anything. Oh, look at that. I'm with him on the caramel, though. I think you got a, you got a caramel sweet tooth yeah. over there. All right. I think we might need a megaphone. <laughs> really? Yes. All right. Uh, I've been on this extended three-on-three for a while, and today I walk in with a little confidence <laughs> because I feel like a bunch of people just jump on board after last night's Jets, Leafs, three-on-three. I'm thinking 10 minutes extended three-on-three. What do you think? Well, I, my understanding is the league has pitched this to the NHL Players Association that's been shot down every time because of the wear and tear. The guys that play three-on-three three aren't guys like me. They're the good players, right? <laughs> so they're, they're, it's really hard. It's for Connor McDavid or if you're, uh, you know, Shifley or anyone who played in that overtime last night, um, it's really hard to, to tack on the minutes. Wouldn't coaches just open the like – we saw Pierre Engvall get – time on three on three i don't think i've seen that before no and i was surprised at that and i i i think that's i this kid really impresses me he's really improved and he skates so well like it's awful to look at his right. skating <laughs> yeah. it's ungainly but it, but he gets there and he's really rapidly improving i think the most improved player on the team would have been mikhaev and then this guy's right behind him for me so but i think the nhlpa is opposed extended Three on three play, and there's uh, you know it could go down to two on two after, you could go down to one on one. There's lots of ways to do this, and avoid the dreaded shootout. Right. So you're you're against the shootout too. Well, I, I voted it. I voted against the shootout. I told Gary Bettman I would vote with if he needed the vote, I'd vote for it because I know our broadcast partners wanted it. They, there is some value to having a winner every time, every night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you've got to do it within a time frame that works, and playoffs excluded. So, but I don't like it. And to me, as I said at the time, it's like having an NFL game decided by having guys throwing footballs through tires. It's a lot like that to me. Right. So I, I, I don't. Uh, I, if we can extend overtime, or change it to make it more, uh, more likely you'll get a result, I would vote for that. Right. But a penalty shot is something that you would see in the course of a hockey game. You hardly ever are going to see two-on-two or one-on-one. Wouldn't that be farther from actually finding something that isn't as gimmicky as the shootout? Well, I I don't know what the answer is. So I suggested this in 1994 at the league, that you start overtime with five-on-five or start with four-on-four, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. You play for a minute, horn sounds, now you play three-on-three for a minute, horn sounds, and – the same player cannot come back on the ice. So you've got to decide. Do you use Wayne Gretzky in the five-on-five, five, save him for the four-on-four, four, save him for the three-on-three? Three? I got laughed out of the room by the GMs. They yeah. thought it was the dumbest thing ever. They, but again, I think shootouts are a worse result than even that. Right. It, so to me, there's a lot of ways to look at it. Shootouts are like there wasn't one fan last night complained about the shootout last night. The, the overtime was outstanding. The shootout was good. That that was a, a for me a crappy hockey game, but a great finish. They do that in kids tournaments where they take yeah. out the five yeah. on five, four on four, three on three. I coached a ball hockey tournament where we got down to the one on one and lost, and it was heartbreaking. And the kid that I had to send out there for the one on one didn't feel the greatest after it was all said and done. But I I wonder if in the end, and I said this to DJ earlier, just the shootout was amazing when it came back. But now that you see it as much as you see it, it's just kind of lost its luster. And we are in the business of entertaining a little bit, though we want the result to be true. Well, you got the shootout last night to me. To, to sit there for the whole six minutes or whatever it took would have been worth it just to watch Liney's goal. <laughs> like for him to, to snap off a shot of that velocity from that far out on a premier goaltender, like that, you, you may never see that shot again in your life. Yeah. You may never see a shot better than that in your life in a shootout. 
see the balance of this conversation and it, the perspective change, whether the league office or the GMs and coaches or the players, is you want something that's entertaining, but you also want to figure out who deserves the three points. Yeah. How do you balance those two things when you're having this dialogue? Well, in my mind, uh, it's got to – what you said earlier makes the most sense to me. A shootout is some a penalty shot occurs in a game. One on one doesn't on the ice. Two on two doesn't. Three on three does, although rarely. Rarely. Yeah. Um, I think this was a compromise at the time, which you know, because the broadcast partners and we're all in the business now, yeah. so they were screaming for a result within the time window, and that they were insisting on it. And and there was nothing wrong with ties back in the day. You got a point for a tie. It was fine, especially when I had crappy teams. I love ties. It was been, it's amazing. Right. right. But um, I think it's been a great success. Nobody leaves when overtime starts. Right. Nobody goes to the bathroom when overtime starts. Right. Nobody leaves their seats. And they're on their feet for the whole shootout. So the fans have embraced it. We've got to embrace it, too. And um, I think the fans speak for, you know, we have to do a lot of, that has to be a, a, a high factor on our list of factors, what the fans want has to be pretty high on that list. Right. Uh, you could have fooled us on the you, lo- you love ties because they're always hanging around your neck. <laughs> ah, clever. <laughs> well, not really. Uh, let me move on. Jets continue to fight. And, and now they're in Boston tonight. And Kulikov's coming back. Like, as they get healthier and they're still winning games, is this a legit Stanley Cup contender when healthy? I'm not sure with this defense. I'm really impressed with what they've done. First off, for for me, and we have a lot of guys doing great jobs coaching in our league this year. Barry Trotz is doing a great job. Yep. Um, you know, there's half a dozen guys you could mention. But for me, the coach of the year is Paul Maurice because of the depletions from their lineup and the deletions from their lineup and the injuries they've had. For him to get that group to continue to compete like they have, he is truly the coach of the year for me to this point in the season, obviously. But I'm not sure this inspirational wave they're riding, and they've got a great captain, I'm not sure they can sustain that in the playoffs with the personnel they have. Now, the guys that are getting their chance here and making the most of it, the Pullmans and the Nikus, they're taking advantage of this opportunity, and they're not auditioning for jobs for the rest of the year, maybe maybe for the rest of their careers. And they've done a good job, but... Are they, is that a good enough defense court to beat someone in a playoff? Not for me, not yet. And in that division, too. Yep. Well, the question is, how are they doing it when you lose that level of defensemen and that amount of defensemen? Is it those guys stepping up, or is Paul Maurice doing something to kind of help them out a little bit? Well, I, I think they're getting great play from their top six forwards. they they got two deadly lines, and that's most teams don't have two deadly lines. They have one deadly line and one okay line. These guys, by splitting up, uh, Wheeler and, and Shifley, they've got two deadly lines. And I think the coach is getting them to play hard all the time. And the young kids that have filled it on defense have done a good job. I think Kulikov's a big addition back into the lineup. I like him as a player. Yeah, me too. Uh, Brian Burke in studio talking to Tim McAuliffe and Donovan Bennett as Sid Sixero is sick. You've been a GM. He's not sick. <laughs> <laughs> What's his compete level? <laughs> Who's Sid's? Yeah. He doesn't have one. <laughs> the great minds think alike or fools seldom differ because I said the exact same. Same thing on the top of the show. Uh, you've been a GM a couple of different times in this league. If I made you the GM of the Montreal Canadiens, a team on the verge of missing the playoffs for a third straight season for just the third time in franchise history, an interesting young core with some good talent, and their two best players, 34 and 32, in Weber and Carey Price, what do you do right now? Well, they're banged up. I mean, they're, they're, they've been missing Brendan Gallagher, who comes back tonight, I think. Yeah. Um, and I love this guy. He's a little ball of hate with skill. He contributes. He plays. He, he drags guys into the fight. Um, but they miss Yoel Armia, who's really been a, a, a real surprise for them. And a wonderful player this year in lots of different circumstances. A guy that really has had a quiet career and all of a sudden is a really important player. Um, so you got number one thing that you wish for as a GM when you go to sleep at night is you pray for health. That's number one. Number two, I think they need some secondary scoring. They're scoring. They have trouble scoring goals. That would be number one on my wish list. They've got good leadership. They've got a top goaltender. He might be scuffling a bit right now, but they've got Gallagher and Weber to lead in the room. Um, I don't think they're as bad as they're playing right now, but I don't know why. They're awful right now. They're awful. Tim mentioned that changes might be coming because they are awful. And my question is, 
Well, if not, who is in place? Who's going to go in and do a better job? The Alouettes in the same market, the football team, are looking at a president GM, and part of the issue is well, we have to get someone in who can do the job and can speak fluent in French. Is there a list of candidates that they could say, well, if not Bergevin, then we could turn over the keys to the franchise and make some big decisions and, and feel comfortable moving forward? Well, to me, I, I can't answer that question for Jeff Molson. For me, if I'm a season ticket holder in Montreal, and I am a season ticket holder here, but if I'm a season ticket holder in Montreal, I want wins. I want W's, and I don't care what the post-game speech is, if it's in French or in English. I think one of those two positions has to be filled by a francophone. I think it's really important that one of them be able to speak to the fans in the language of their choice, but I don't think they both have to be. For example, if you had a great former Canadian like a Larry Robinson, assume he doesn't speak French, I don't know if he does or not, would, they, would fans accept him as a coach if he won games? I think so, absolutely. Yeah. Mark Crawford went to coach the Quebec Nordique, did not speak French, pledged to take French lessons and learn passable French, that can be done. Yeah. Uh, the other part of this that I don't think a lot of people are talking about is that 12 of the 22 home games, they haven't sold out. Now, I know they have a bigger arena. Big in, barn, yeah. Yeah, in, in Montreal. And sometimes when you're not at a sellout at 21,000, who gives a bleep? But they're not used to that. No. Like Jeff Molson's not used to seeing 12 of 22 not sold out. And I think some of that is, is kind of the residue of, of the last few years of not making the postseason and the fact that they have salary cap space that they haven't used. Yeah, I think fans are that that is a bone of contention in Montreal that they haven't spent to the cap. The only other Canadian team that's not bumping up against the cap is Ottawa. And people understand that where they are in the process of the number of kids they have. Right. But that is a, a source of contention and when you've got the biggest building in the league tied with Chicago, twenty one thousand, and you don't have cheap tickets and you're not spending the cap, that is that bothers people there. Yeah, I would agree. Of the Canadian teams, we, we talked about Winnipeg a little bit. Which would you say is the greatest, based on what we've seen almost at the halfway point, greatest contender to, to lift the cup? I, I'm not sure that there is a legitimate contender among the seven teams. I'm going to get a flurry of emails about this, but I think the Flames are a really good team, but I'm not sure – that they're going to have playoff success. I'm not sure they have the experience yet to do that. Uh, Winnipeg, I think, defense is suspect, and the others all have big warts, big warts. Vancouver's going to fight just to get in. Edmonton's going to fight just to get in. So to me, uh, I would say the closest team is Winnipeg and neck and neck with Calgary, but I wouldn't put them in a class with a Tampa Bay who's suddenly come back to life, mm -hmm. a right. Washington you know, I think they're St. Louis. I think they're elite teams, and I'm not sure any of them are Canadian. I don't want to do this, but there's uh, some Leaf fans yelling right now, 15-5-2 and two yeah. under Shelton Keefe. Yeah. But my view on this is... And I, is they're still not tough enough to compete in the postseason, well, or is it the division? Or no, is it both? I, and I, I shouldn't have left them out. Um, I would say this. I, don't, I think it's the division, yeah. and I don't think they're built for playoff success. We're going to find out, right? Like, they're yeah. not changing. Oh, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. Hope no, I'm wrong. I'm, I'm not saying that you're wrong or you're right, but I think we're going to find out because I don't think they're going to change. I think they No, and, and, and I like sincerely... Mason Marchment, maybe. And I sincerely hope that I'm wrong on this because, I mean, no one benefits more than Brian Burke if these guys can win a championship. I'm a season ticket holder. We're a rights holder. Right. So I hope I'm wrong. Right. Let me ask you one more before we move on from the Canadian teams because Mike Smith is getting the call again tonight and Cam Talbot is getting the call again tonight in Edmonton and Calgary, respectively. Both those teams really need goaltending. Are you seeing something from either one of those guys that makes you think that, I don't know if he'll take Koskinen's spot, I don't know if he'll take Riddick's spot, but are you seeing something from either of those goalies that would have you ride this hot hand even more? I would, I would continue to play both goalies in the short term. Right. Mike Smith's been sharp. Cam Talbot's been sharp. What you want is a platoon type system, anyway. Right. The old the old days where the starter would play seventy games and the and the backup would be lucky to get you know the remaining twelve. That doesn't happen anymore. You want a 55, 35 split or whatever. I, don't, I know the math doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> or you want a, a sixty twenty two split, maybe. But uh, I think fifty five is the number most goalie coaches would ask for from their starters. So right. the fact that they're getting games out of the backup goaltender and fighting for the net, that's a good thing. Did you go to Harvard? 
Yes, I did. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure as we went but, 60-22 on the split. You know what the hard part is? 55, I'm like, okay, what's 55? What's the number that adds up to 82? And it doesn't come to you quickly, right? <laughs> right, it's, right. There's a 7 in there somewhere, yeah, I think. 60-22 makes it easier. Yeah. I got it, yeah. Uh, we always appreciate you stopping by. We won't name the segment yet. Numbers oh. with Brian Burke. No, <laughs> no, no. Numbers with Brian Burke. Yeah. Uh, someone's yelling in my ear for the third time, the Burke stops here. Oh, God. <laughs> right. That's, the, that's why I left it out the first two times. But when they yell in my ear, it's hard to let it go. No Either, ties, no worries with Brian Burke. No ties, no... Uh, nope. I think we're getting worse as we go along. Right. Thank I you apologize. for stopping Thanks, by. Guys. I appreciate it.